This is a big group today. Look at this, right? How many are SAG members? Uh, all right, good. That's great. I love that. Good for us. Well, I have to tell you all as we get started, this musical is perfection in every way from the creation, the direction, and the cast. Thank you very much. <laughs> that did deserve its own card. Yes, thank you very much. That deserve its own card. What did you, yeah, what did you question, find most perfect about it? What, what? I know, totally. <laughs> My first question is for David Yazbek and Itamar Moses. How did you come about writing this beautiful and heartfelt musical? So, <laughs> the musical is based on an Israeli So, the film. musical is based <laughs> of the same, on an Israeli film it. as a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna make a joke about uh, l lyrics. I, um, it's based on a film from about 10 years ago. Uh, Oren Wolf, who is our lead producer, saw the movie in a film festival on the Upper West Side uh, that happens every year called the Other Israel Film Festival, which focuses on films that show aspects of Israeli society or life in the Middle East that aren't normally the focal point. So he saw the film of the band visit there and was struck by this vision that it belonged on stage. So that began a long process for him of, first of all, acquiring the rights, which uh, Iran Kohler and the filmmaker was reluctant to give him. Um, because he said... <laughs> oh, because... Well, he didn't really know anything about musicals, and he said... Uh, I'll try to do my Iran impression. He said, uh, the only musical I know is cats, so <laughs> I think he's going to dress them as cats. <laughs> it don't make sense. So he, so he had to ask Iran several times, and then... Uh, uh, First, he thought it might be a play with music, and only after a couple of years of sort of thinking about it and development, um, he hired uh, Yazbek and myself to to do the adaptation. So that was how we got involved. Is we were sort of approached individually. We didn't know each other at the time, and said, "Hey, look at you know." We were each each of us was told, "Hey, look at this movie and think if it's if it's something you might see yourself being able to adapt." So, David, did you start writing the score first? No. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. Um, we did. He, it, he still hasn't started. We did. Uh, <laughs> we did a. Uh, I don't know if you notice. There's 18 numbers in the show. So, um, the, the, we did actually did a reading of a of an adaptation of uh, Itamar's first sort of go around with a cast, with one song, <laughs> and it really worked. So um, maybe I shouldn't have done any more songs. <laughs> Not um, with this cast. You, did you say but with with? Uh, uh, yeah. I think one or two. Anybody? Yeah, you were. No, it was Bill and Bill and George. Bill Army and George Abud, I believe. We're in the were first in, reading. And Tony. Shalou. And Tony. Shalou. And Tony. Yeah. Um, but that was a long, long time ago. We were excited about the tone of the movie, not just about the stories and the characters, but about the tone of it. It was unlike any movie that I had seen, probably. And we wanted to make a musical that honored that tone. Not the exact same tone, but we wanted to do something different. Oh, that's a title of one of the songs. See, see how that we works. wanted to do something that we hadn't seen before on it's stage. It's also a lyric in this. Yeah. It's, also, it's also a title of a song, yeah. So, oh, right, never seen before. Jesus, we could, <laughs> we could go down this lyrics. rabbit hole. <laughs> this so is that how was rehearsals it. went, by the way. This is all. They were a really close company, as you can tell. <laughs> For David Cromer, how did you come about to direct it, and why did you want to direct it? Uh, it's about two years ago, July, I believe. You guys did a workshop uh, of a version of it. There was another director attached for a long time, and, uh, and he left. And I, I have one. Does anyone need a water? Uh, pass um, down. Uh, during my answer, pass them down. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Jonathan, you got one? <laughs> uh, I'm good. Thank you, Yazbek. Thanks. Would you like a water? <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I had worked with Edomar, and I had worked with the Atlantic Theater Company. I had met David Yazbek, and I didn't know Oren Wolf, the lead producer at all, but I, I knew a few people. The original director left the project, and I think maybe Edomar mentioned it, or somebody mentioned, oh, I'm sure there was a list, and by the time they got to me... <laughs> they were, you know. So I just got a call. Edomar asked me if I'd seen the movie. I said no. He told me about, uh, he told me that I'll, I'll never be able to repeat it correctly. 
He told me the setup. He told me the plot of it in one sort of simple sentence. It was incredibly evocative. That was incredibly spare, and that was just it was open ended and was really engaging. So I was automatically enchanted by the idea of how he described it, which felt like something that was not going to be overt, overly explained, overly overly stated, overly hammering on the head. And then everything after that turned out to be the the case. The film, uh, the music. That I heard, and so I, I came in, and then, and and luckily, I think that the I joined these guys on on what the what the tone was, and then my job became to kind of figure out how to how to transform the tone of the film, not 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 copy the tone of the film, but transform the tone of the, embrace the things and let it grow into something else. We had worked on, we had spent so much time working on tone tonal issues for so long. <laughs> and then Dave comes in and basically does, you know, the same amount of work in an eighth of the time, yeah. you know. Um, and it all it all really came together when Dave when David Cromer came on. Yeah, it isn't actually true that there was some enormously long list of directors that like way way because when you when we started to ask ourselves, well, okay, it's this musical, but it's a very spare, very quiet musical. It requires like a very you know, uh, rigorous but naturalistic touch. There's a lot of scene work that needs to be done. That you know, and then you start to think to yourself, who, you know, and, and even though he's not primarily known for musicals, he's done them. You know, the Adding Machine musical that was off Broadway and was so wonderful. So, um, that's not a huge list of like the directors who have that skill set. So when his name came up, we immediately was sort of our antennas went off, and we were like, maybe. Um, so yeah, it really turned out to be a great fit. Yeah. For the actors, what attracted all of you originally to the project when you first heard about it and why you wanted to be a part of this? For me, it was easy. My, uh, my parents are both Israeli. I knew the film. It's very popular in Israel. And I think Sean and I both, uh, coming from a Middle Eastern background, we don't get many opportunities to play Middle Eastern characters. So that was amazing and just speaking being able to speak our mother tongue on stage was really yeah uh, uh, really exciting yeah i remember i found out about that it was going to be done at the atlantic and i told my parents oh my god they're going to do the band's visit as a musical and if you've seen the film you see that it's a very quiet realistic movie and my mom was like what they're going to join this music in moving to a musical how it's going to work it's going to be so boring you know like she was like i don't get it because she thinks like broadway musical it's gonna be like flashy and you know i was like i don't know ima but i really want to be in it you know <laughs> so when i had when i got my first audition i was like i have to sing a song in hebrew so that they know that i'm israeli and they know i can speak hebrew you know <laughs> so i was very very excited even before the first audition uh, I was excited because uh, the Full Monty is one of my favorite musicals, and yep. David Yazbek. Oh no 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 no! Oh thank and you! Oh thank you! <laughs> I'm not kidding. And Does anybody need a water or anything? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. And 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 Bach at Leipzig is one of my favorite plays I've ever seen in New York, and Edomar wrote that. <laughs> and I saw David David Cromer's Our Town, and I loved that. And then when I found out I was going to get to audition for something that they were working on together, I said yeah, and that's why. I... I auditioned, and I'm very happy I got to be a part of it. John, John also said something really funny to me when we were in rehearsals at the Atlantic. He was like, you know, I always do these big Broadway shows, and that's what people think of me, but I've always wanted to be one of the cool kids <laughs> doing the, the like, interesting artsy work downtown, and you guys finally gave me that, and then there you are, back uptown. <laughs> you carry on a curse. <laughs> it, it does feel like a cool kid thing, though. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Oh, I don't really have anything exciting to say after that. I um, I didn't know any of these guys, uh, and I just went to an audition. That's how that happened. <laughs> that could happen to you too, SAG members. So, what did you all do at your audition? Like those final calls. I sat there. Yeah. Oh no, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I also did a Hebrew song because. I mean, you got to show off the goods. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I did that, and then and then we had sides uh, for the character. Uh, my character is Sami, uh, so I had that, and yeah, it was pretty straightforward. Yeah, I actually, from the first time audition to the 
to to the end, I wound up going in for, a, I think, three different roles when it was all said and done. Because um, I think they were just like, we like you. We just don't know how, where to put you. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, no. That's exactly um, right. <laughs> so, well, thank- no, no, no. She, she can't. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, so, so, yeah, it was actually really cool. I got to read sides for a bunch of different characters. Um, I sang a bunch of different songs. I sang a song in Hebrew. I sang a Alanis Morissette song once. Then I sang a, like, Etta James 50s, 60s song. Yeah. And then at the very end of my last audition, Cromer was like, oh, by the way, do you roller skate? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, I won't have to, like, really roller skate. I'll just, like, have to stand in roller skates during the roller skating scene, and it'll be fine. And then, like, during rehearsal, like, can you do this? Can you do that? Can Arabesque. you do this? I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> oh, but they brought someone to help us learn, and, and now it's actually really fun. Yeah. Is this the question about the audition? Yes. I think I think I played the clarinet for you. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. yeah. And then I sang the song the lullaby and did the scene and that's what I remember. It's hard to audition for people you think a lot of. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's really yeah. scary cuz you don't want to be awful for them cuz you You, like you them hit so it much. well. <laughs> No, I always have to follow the cool stories. <laughs> um, I went to the audition, and then I went to a callback, and then there was a third that. callback, and I said, what more can you want from me? I showed you everything I have. Um, I think I we were so... I have to say about that. Could I, could I say something yeah, about the auditions? Just because yeah. there's specific stories to all of them, and that might be interest, of interest to, oh, yeah, to totally, the actors. Yeah. Uh, you said something, Katrina, interesting the other day. I remember we were talking about something, and you just said, it w- I went in because it was a job, which isn't, which is, is just so much more true than I, I, you know what I mean, or as true or as realistic as I wanted it since I was a kid, this is my part, or I was moved by, you know, mostly it's like, uh, okay, job, I'll go over there, you know, you're just hired and you have to fall in love with it somehow. Um, Katrina, I remember, uh, the, the reason you had to come back so many times, we had no idea who we were going to cast in the part. The reason you had to come back so many times was because, first of all, producers had to see her, but also we started to think it, it was too good to be true. And I know that sounds like a really cute, sweet story, but we started to go, like, there's got to there's be something wrong. Like, she's going to turn out to be crazy, or she's going to, you know what I mean? She's going to turn out to be me, or something. Like, it's, it's, it's not, you know what I mean? She won't show up. She'll just turn out to be this person. Because why, why well, we she's of, available to us? Why right. somebody this good is available to us? We started discussing to things like, let's put baloney on her seat to see how she deals with that. Um, let's be especially nasty to right. see how she deals right. with that. So that I mean that was that John yeah. uh, John came there was this period where we sort of thought everyone might be playing instruments so we stupidly asked people to bring in instruments and they did that was never going to happen and so John played the clarinet but you read for we read you for every every like Israeli part I think we read you for like it's like extensively for it's ex- we read you for Golden My Ear that's yeah, yeah, how yeah. that's yeah. how extensive <laughs> right yeah. And Sharon, I just remember you sa- I, I, you sang once, and we were just like, well, she's in the show, we just don't know where, you know? Um, and Jonathan and I actually knew each other from Chicago, so, so I was always like, why would he be good as that? You know what I mean? So they're all utterly different. Did you guys want to say something about Oh, just that the, the thing, it's very true with Katrina, like, because that's a very specific part, Dina, and it, yeah. you need to have a lot of qualities, and it's one of those parts where you start an audition process, and you're like, we may not find this person. We might not find this person right away. We might not find them. We might have to start searching internationally. Like, where is this person going to be? And then when someone walks in and just nails it, it did feel, we, we sort of didn't believe it at first. We were like, there's got, you know, and and also we were just sort of like, how is this person not already hugely famous? <laughs> we had all of the, we all had, had all those conversations. So, uh, so it took us a while to sort of realize, no, it really, it, it really is we really did get this lucky. So I think I think Katrina's audition story is a much more powerful and emotional story for us than it, than it is for her. Well, I, I gotta say, like, it's not that I was like, oh, I don't care, I'll just go. Like, I, I think I'd had a series of really terrible auditions before that and was just like, okay. I just, this is just gonna be bad too. So I think I had gotten to a place in my head of like, don't get attached. Because if you, you know, if you love every project so much before you get to do it, it's like devastating when you don't get to go and work on it. So I think I had gotten in this place where like, I'm just gonna go and audition and be like, whatever, at the end of it. And so that's that thing, like, you know, the least, the less you care when you go in, somehow the better you do sometimes in the auditions. It was definitely one of those times where I was like, I'm just not gonna 
cry when this one's over. <laughs> well, the, the one other anecdote is I did call around a little bit because I wanted to ask people, like I saw, I asked a few people I knew, did they know you? And <laughs> this might be upsetting to hear. People said no. People said, oh, I love her. I love her. We almost cast her in Thing X. We almost cast her. We were just, we, she almost had, oh, the, we loved her for blah, 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 blah. But for a couple of things, they just, it just, they picked someone else and then, then that made you available to us. <laughs> you know? Worked out okay. Yeah. <laughs> there are so many wonderful messages in this show. What personally moves each of you about this show? We can start with the actors. Take your time. Not that much time. I, well, here, okay, I'll, I'll start. I, I, I think, okay, well, uh, in the world we live in today, I think it's such a beautiful story that when people are in need, people help. So for me, I think that that's, that's my biggest thing about this show. Yeah, and I, similarly, I think it's about... For me, it's about, it's so beautiful to see yourself in somebody who you think is different than you and realize that perhaps they're really not. And, you know, however you connect with them through music, in our show, it's usually through music, but um, I don't know, just seeing somebody that either is, you're told is different than you or thinks different than you or you just assume is different than you and then realizing you're so similar in so many ways is... Um, very, very touching to me because I've had lots of experiences where that's happened successfully in my life and unsuccessfully. So I love that our show does that. I, I was, I, I like the way pain dribbles out of all of the people. <laughs> and I was watching the, I like to watch the roller rink scene because I love it so much. Uh, it's when, the, it's basically the young love story in the play. And uh, when uh, Khaled, who pl uh, played by Ari Stachel, reveals that he has an arranged marriage last night. Somebody in the front row went, oh, no. And I just, like, it's so cool to hear stuff like that because you think he's so cool and so fine, and then you find out he's a mess, too. And I just, I really like that part of it, the play in general. Um, I and, and nobody leaves with the tragedy. Like, that's, like, yeah. everybody's trying to be cool and happy, and then it just kind of flies out that there's, like, mini tragedy. Sorry. No, uh, uh, I like the little, that the, it talks about hope in a small way, in a, an accessible way, as opposed to like the grand hope of like that we all felt when Obama was president. <laughs> and uh, now that there's maybe not as much grand hope out there, um, it's really nice that to be like, well, there is still hope, and it maybe like sm small amounts of hope can still have an effect on you and can still push you forward and in like seeming mediocre ways, but those little mediocre ways add up to maybe something bigger down the line. And I, I like that about the show a lot. I would, I would just piggyback on what, what Katrina said. It's that, it's that uh, the incremental, the tiny incremental steps forward that can be taken in life. That's mostly what movement forward is. Little tiny victories, even when it seems like uh, uh, we're in stagnation. I find that very moving because it's more recognizable because those things, those very small ones, when something goes a little better, are seismic. And I guess the only other thing I've arrived at about the show is that I have at various times in my life thought, well, this is it. It's not going to get any more interesting than this. This is sort of it. I, I'm done with certain things in my life and certain things aren't going to happen anymore. And... I'm constantly surprised because it, life keeps coming and it often keeps coming in very positive ways, and it can. So it was actual hope, actual hard-earned hope is, I, mean, I find, very moving. Things couldn't get a little better. Yeah. Um, yes, I agree, with, I agree with all of that. I think the, I think the show gets at something about um, the way that everyone is sort of the main character of their own story, and to them, like... It's epic. It's huge. The stakes are literally life and death. And it kind of, there's something about the show that reminds me of the way in which that's true for, for everybody. And that feels like a big emotional idea. But there's also sort of a meta lesson that, I, that moves me about um, our experience on it as, as artists that like, it's, it's, and you get these examples every now and then in your career. Like, they're a little bit few and far between. But, but, um, but it's it, it's been also a really good reminder of if of like the the 
we know we like intellectually we know that it's true that if you work on something like with integrity and like and like um let it you know not worry about pleasing the widest possible audience and and worry in sort of a uh, uh, like a fretful, anxious way about like, will people like this? Will people like that? You just try to make the thing true to itself and then like leave everything else up to the fates. We all know that's what we're supposed to do, but it's really hard. You're always sort of running a gauntlet of your own doubts and fears and, and notes that are coming at you from the outside. And so this has been by far the, the, the and maybe the strongest I'll ever get, like affirmation of approaching something that way. Because when we were working on this show before it was off Broadway and when we were doing it downtown, I don't think any of us ever anticipated quite the um, the sort of journey that it ended up having. Um, so, like, it, it's it's a very like in your face for me. It's like a very in your face reminder of that of that lesson. Yeah, that, uh, the, our music supervisor, who's an old old friend of mine, Dean, said uh, at some point <clears throat> while we were at the Atlantic, he said. Um, you should remember this experience because it'll never get this good. <laughs> and I think he's right, actually. For me, the, the, the most moving, uh, I mean, it changes all the time, but there's something about the way that there's this burgeoning, um, this sense of like when you drop a pebble uh, in a pond and it just, the, the rings keep, keep expanding out. Um, there's just this sense that on the stage, there are characters connecting. There's a very like a really honest, non-manipulative brand of of acting going on that you don't see in musicals. And I love seeing that. I just love it. It's the cast, it's David Cromer, you know, honoring what I think we had we put into the into the script. But then it it keeps expanding and you see these musicians, um, m much of what they're playing is not pre-written. I mean, the songs are written, but sometimes they're, they're improvising off of each other. And you're seeing this connection that is absolutely authentic and real because it's really happening. It's not written lines or notes. And then it just keeps expanding out. And then you have this audience who by the end is crying and laughing and they don't know why. And I think, I think the reason why is that they're actually feeling the connection that we're talking about. You know, it become it stops being a metaphor and it actually starts happening. And the thing that gets me is when they're the the idea that they're leaving the theater and that maybe that those concentric rings will keep expanding once they leave the theater. Yeah. We'll get back into the rings again, because that's a fascinating thing from starting at the Atlantic and moving to Broadway. But I want to talk to the actors. Explain to the audience, talk about the roles that you play and what it's like living in their skin. You are all so good at what you do in conveying these roles. Talk about who you play, tell them, and what's it like living in it. Any of you can start. Uh, I play Itzik, uh, a new dad, an unemployed dad. <laughs> and uh, my marriage is in a little bit of trouble. My wife is Iris, played by Kristen C. Um, it's the first dad I've ever played. Um, I'm not a particularly certain guy, and he's not a particularly certain guy, so it wasn't particularly difficult to find my way to him and I grew up in a place that's far away from things and very rural so I think I always have felt like getting out <laughs> so these people want out in some way but they don't know how to get out <laughs> um I don't know I read it and thought this is me and I want to play this part so I really don't know what to say <laughs> um it's kind of how I feel so that's all I have to say about it Beautiful. uh I play Anna she's a, a young girl in the town She's kind of like your typical, like, confident Israeli girl. Um, what I actually love about playing her is um, I feel like sometimes there's this stereotype of, like, a young girl who's um, confident and attractive is, like, seen as kind of like an idiot or, like, bubbly or not necessarily taken seriously. But, like, I love that she's just, like, a real girl and just because she's like out and having a good time doesn't mean she's like a moron you know what i mean and just because she likes to care about what she looks like and she's has like lots of pda moments on the street or whatever doesn't mean she's not smart and strong and um i don't know i think there's like a misconception about people like that so uh i like to bring some like realness to her and um 
Yeah, and I like to roller skate on stage. It's pretty fun. <laughs> I also get to, uh, I, I, I actually realized one of the other actors in the show pointed out to me, I didn't even realize it myself, um, that I only speak Hebrew in the show. I don't speak any English, which like I didn't even realize. I do say okay at one point, <laughs> but people in Israel say okay. Um, and uh, so that's really, really cool. And also the fact that I get to just like cuss out one guy is really, really fun. <laughs> you can always tell how many Hebrew speakers are in the audience because there's some filthy, filthy pretty, stuff in the show. Filthy. But it's all in other languages. There's like eight people who gasp. Yeah. <laughs> My dad, the first time he saw it, he was like, whoa! <laughs> yeah, she's got a filthy mouth. Um, so I play Sami, uh, who is a married man who's having an affair with Dina, Katrina's character. And I also play the guard. And I'm referred to as an asshole and a son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, and we had a talk back the other night, and and you know people were asking a similar question. You know what what's it like to play these characters? And and, and it's it's fun. I mean, I, I I think I'm a nice person in real life. Um, maybe other people think that this is typecasting. I don't know. Um, we'll talk but uh, but it's fun. It's fun to be able to yeah cuss somebody out and and yell it. Katrina Lank every night on stage, and uh, it's, I think what I like about this character is that, I mean, there's, both of these characters, there, there is, there's a reality to where they're coming from and why they are how they are, and I think finding that is always a fun challenge with someone who might seem unredeemable um, on, on the page, but, but that there is, in fact, a real person there and someone struggling with, you know, Cromer would always talk to us about, about these mistakes. A lot of these characters live and have to deal with the mistakes they make. And, and I like that. I like have forcing myself to realize what it is that to deal with that stuff and how you get out of it if you can get out of it and if you can't you know dealing with that reality too so uh, i play dina who's like the um she runs the the one cafe in town so because she's in charge of the food she's sort of like the mayor of the town um you know everyone goes and hangs out at the cafe well four people go out and hang out at the cafe um and she similarly to what um jonathan was saying and sharon eh, yeah um there's a she definitely has a, a a realness meaning like an ugliness quote unquote um that's uh grounded in like what her past experiences have been and this is something Cromer talked about with us as well like there's a difference between being a nice person and a good person and a good person isn't necessarily always nice but they can still be good and I think fundamentally she and all all of the people in the town are they're good people but just aren't always nice and just make mistakes and sometimes are jerks and um, have to deal with what they've done in their lives every day and um, I, I like these imperfect uh, qualities about Dina a lot. I want to talk to David Cromer. For those of you who have not seen this show, the direction is seamless. This is absolutely, please. Yeah. You also take people into the souls of all these people on stage. Like when you see this show, you know all these people. They're like your family up there. It's very interesting. And as one of you talked about tone, all of you talked about tone earlier, there's a hypnotic feel to this show when you go. You think it's not about a lot of stuff when you go, and it's about absolutely everything. It's about the human condition and the human spirit. Talk about directing this, David, with this incredible company and these creators of just making the magic you do as a director. Well, I, you know, we're, we're one, of the, one of the things that sort of happens is I hear us talking about it and, and, and almost in a, in a reverent tone and we don't really sort of feel that way about it. We're always, we're sort of talking in many ways about the source material, I think a lot, which is the film. You know what I mean? Because we, like we have, we, I feel an ownership of the band's visit, but I also feel ownership of the fact that, I mean, I also understand that we were coming from this source material. So... I said fairly early on, or, you know, I mean, that was late in the process, but I said fairly early on, we're not going to run from the movie, you know, when people are creating something. It's like, we're, we're different from them. I wanted to embrace the spell that Iran Coleran cast when he made this this uh, film. Um, and so that was, that became part, and that was in 
David's music and it was in Edmar's book and it was in the spareness that they were moving towards and and uh, the, the 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 terrain of it, like places where it was incredibly dense and places where it just became just like a wisp of a show, a very small, thin little thing just kind of hanging in the air and this sense of space. So we just tried to, on some level, you have to figure out kind of practical, physical ways to manifest that. I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but sort of one of the things I knew fairly early on, there's a lyric at, um, that David wrote in the first song, Waiting, which is a character who says, sometimes it feels like you're moving in a circle around and around with the same scenery going by. And I, I sort of thought initially it would be funny. I, I pictured that character actually rotating um, uh, and realizing he was rotating, and I thought that might be sort of funny. So I said, well, there'd need to be a big turntable, and it would have to be going very slowly. And that just started out, turned into this thing where we felt like the thing would be in sort of, in a play about stagnation, in a play about a certain, certain amount of stillness, uh, we would try to figure out what, and the first song is called Waiting, we would try to figure out what's the sort of active, seemingly still, but moving forward vibe of, of waiting. Um, I would say that, uh, uh, or I always experience when I'm listening to David's music, that um, there's a, there's, sometimes it can be very, centered or very almost laid back but there's always a groove it's always moving forward even if it seems to be very still so that sort of motor of life is a spell that kind of even in absolute stagnation the thing is always floating a little bit forward a little bit forward uh i was struck by the idea that um if everyone is uh, the Israeli characters all to each other would speak Hebrew. The Arabic, uh, the Egyptian characters all to each other would speak Arabic. But because they have to deal with each other, they all struggle through their second common language, which is English, which none of them are great at. So then there's this other thing holding everybody back. So the thing's floating forward while they're struggling, while there's a groove going on, while they're waiting, while they're wanting. So it just created a kind of a, a tension that was between stillness and moving forward. And I'm I'm g just guessing at this answer. I'm sorry. And it, like, and it turned out to, and then we just sort of tried to sort of harness that, yeah. which is that it would be a, there would need to be a, a a a a way in which it traveled with a kind of muscularity always forward that might do something to the audience's perception. You're, you approach this show. I, this is a, I can't imagine a harder show to direct. Yeah. Um, and my sense when I think about. Uh, Cromer's direction and when I've seen him working I'm, is that he's directing from the inside out. It's very easy. No, it isn't. It's not easy to direct a musical. It's a fucking three ring circus. <laughs> but you could treat many musicals, I would say m most musicals, like a three ring circus. And you can say, oh, well, now we got to have a big number, you know. And you can't do that with this show. This show is, is, it's on. It's inside. You know. It's moving your heart. It's it's pulling you by this thread that's attached to your heart, um, and because of that, you have to have an emotional intelligence, and you have to understand how you can uh, generate from the stage that that type of internal stuff. And and Cromer does a <laughs> does an amazing job. Like, yeah. David Yasbeck, this looks like the musical you were waiting to write. I mean, the score of this is flawless. And I just love it. All your musicals, everything sounds different. Nothing sounds the same. And what I love about this one is it looked like that perfect melding of the Israeli music and the Arabic music, which I'm sure is a world you wanted to work in. Well, it was exciting to work in, in those modalities, yeah. Middle Eastern modalities. Um, I'm a big fan of that stuff, of Arabic, classical Arabic, but also pop um, and also Northern African. And, um, so, and I've always have been. Uh, so it was really fun to dive into that kind of stuff and buy a darbuka and play it a little bit. And, you know, um, but it's it's interesting because there's a lot of that sort of, you know, so-called authentic, what they call oriental music, Arabic, classical, um, played by the band. But a lot of the songs, you know, are just sort of like effective musical theater songs that just felt right for the emotions. Um, so really what... What I was excited about was what we were all talking about, which is you see this movie and you're like, well, how are we going to do this? I, I'm not sure how, but I know if we do it right, it's going to be pretty amazing. And um, uh, that, was the, that was the fun of it, you know, biting into that juicy piece of, I guess, pomegranate. Is that a Middle Eastern fruit? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 
Each Omar, what unlocked it for you? Um, that's a that's a good question. I mean, th it, it got unlocked for me a, a couple of times at a couple of levels. Um, first, it was in my first draft, it uh, doing the very basic translation from filmic language to theatrical language, which is similar. I mean, I've also adapted novels to the stage, like other stuff. And at least a movie, you're in the right, the same ballpark. You know, it's a, it's in the form of a script. It's a piece of dramatic storytelling. But it was just, and, and, and the first thing that unlocked it for me was admiring the, the, the strength of the structure that the film already established. Just the very basic structural bones of everyone arrives, um, and then it splits up into, uh, I said this, uh, 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 I, uh, recently I, I sort of, I realized, I don't know that I ever articulated it this way even while I was working on it, but that it, it literally, when it splits into several storylines, it's like, you know, it's structured like an episode of The Sopranos. Like, it's, there's an A story, a B story, a C story, and a D runner. You know, it's that rigorous. And, uh, you know, the, the, the content is obviously different, but on a, like a, deep, you know, level of structure below the dialogue, it's, it's very sound. So that was the first thing was like, oh, I can, I'm going to have to move things around and change things and add stuff. But, but the bedrock structurally is, is, is there. Um, the second thing was thematic. It was like, what is this show about? Why is it, why is it so moving? And the, the peg for me, um, we did it, we were doing an early read through. We did a lot of different like little readings and workshops of the script. And at one of them, uh, there's a line near the end, and I won't spoil too much for any people who here who haven't seen the show. But you know, one of the one of the characters is is talking about something tragic that happened in his past, and he, and the explanation for why this bad thing happened is he says, um, "I didn't understand him," and uh, and he says it twice. He says, "I didn't understand. I didn't understand him." And I thought that's the whole story. That's what every single storyline in this in this show is about. It's about the need to be understood. The, 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 the enormous rewards of understanding and working to understand and the, the, tr the tragedy and, the, and the, the sort of negative outcomes of not understanding and not making the effort to understand. And once, once I grasped that, it was much easier to decide um, which, you know, what aspects to tease out when I was adding pieces to the plot you know, you don't want to add things just to add them. They have to be right. They can't be arbitrary. So it's like, well, is it extending this idea? Is it is it about, you know, this theme? Uh, so those those were the keys for me. This is, I've worked with a lot of book writers now. It, it, what he's talking about, the structural stuff, and that's like, that's the job. That's the hard thing. That's why this book is so sound and so amazing. Um, and makes it much easier for me to work, you know, as as well. But it's it's kind of a hidden art art form, you know. And um, I was just on a panel of like a bunch of book writers, and we were every two minutes, someone threw out a different metaphor for what book writing it is. It's like it's like it's like the foundation of a house. It's like tending a plant. But I did I you know every two minutes was a different one. But like it, I think foundation of a house is good yeah. because if you do it perfectly. No one ever notices or thinks about the foundation, but if you do it wrong, the house falls down. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's... You know, I want to ask you about collaboration. We were all sitting upstairs before this all began, and just to watch these three gentlemen sit together like three brothers, as three brothers would talk to each other, like waiting to go to a family function. <clears throat> well, I mean, yeah. I, you know, I started as a comedy writer. These are two of the funniest people yeah. I know. I mean, Cromer's... Cromer's, <laughs> you're an asshole. Cromer's, um, okay, so you guys are saying a lot of nice things about me. Am I sick? Uh, yes. Cromer, yes, you are in, in ways that, yes. Cromer is, um, his, his pop culture, I mean, we're similar ages. His, his the, just, he, what was the thing you just referenced when we were upstairs? Space food sticks? Space food sticks. <laughs> No Anybody one knows space, space food sticks. sticks. Chrome and I no. know space. So, you know, it's like... It's, it's the it's, food the astronauts ate. Yeah. <laughs> you could buy them. They were like General Mills, you know. All right. um, but, but it's like my mother, the just car. Google, yeah. It's just all these <clears throat> references. And, and, you know, he's incredibly funny. And Itamar's a little younger. Um, but, you know, if you read his, any of his plays, you see that this is a man with a great sense of humor. And for me, that's the thing that, you know, that's, that's what keeps things 
keeps things very, very pleasant no matter what, you know. And also we're all, you know, we're not, we're all, what's the, we're, not, we're all, we're all really not perfectionists, but we're all sort of like reaching for quality. You know, there isn't, I'm not, I'm not kidding. It's like, there isn't a sense of like, all right, yeah, this is okay. You know, there's never, you never get that, you know. It's a much more neurotic, like maybe this is terrible. There's a Jewish thing going on too, and, you know. But are we kidding ourselves is like the question we start every meeting with. Yeah, yeah. But, and there's also a sense of taking the work very seriously and not taking ourselves seriously. You know, the, the big joke was always, and that's why our show is so important. We'd say it over and over again, kidding, you know, but... Um, now, it turns out it is pretty important. So. <laughs> we went to this little town called Gerucham, which is um, the Beit HaTikva, which is the town where the musical takes place, is fictional. But it, it, he shot a lot of the movie, a lot of the exteriors, and sort of was inspired by this little town um, in the middle of the Negev, in the desert, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, uh, and, and that's sort of the model for, for, for the town in the, in the show. And I had, I'd been to Israel before. I have My, my parents were, were both born there. I have relatives still there. Um, but I'd never been to this town. And just to be in this place, that's there's nothing. Like you look, you know, you're at the town center and you walk for four minutes and you're at the, not even, you walk for 90 seconds, you're at the edge of the town. You know, there's like a hill where there's a bench and the bench is facing nothing. <laughs> like as far as, as far as the eye could see, like to the horizon. Um, like you can probably see into Jordan. Like that's what you're seeing. And like, uh, and, and the way the wind sounds and the heat, um, it was, I don't know, it just made it real in a way that yeah. was really, the other funny thing that happened was, um, you know, when you land at the airport and you go to the, whatever, the hotel, people, the, the Israelis ask you where you're going to go. Like, oh, well, will you go? Are you here? And we said, um, well, you know, we're going to go through Jerusalem, then we're going to go down to Yerucham. Why? Every, <laughs> the same flat, like, why? Why you go there? It's nothing. Why? One person literally was like, it's a garbage pit, why? <laughs> and that, so the attitude of like the rest of the country to the place was useful. So yeah, that it was. It is decidedly not a garbage pit. No, it's, it's kind of, ble- yeah. it's a little bleak, but sort of gorgeous and, yeah, and inspiring, yeah. yeah. I, learned that, I learned that Katrina Lenk was a good hang. That's what I learned. <laughs> that it was fun to hang with Katrina Lenk. <laughs> We spent you know. a lot of time in a van, like yeah. all of us, plus uh, a cameraman, a, someone oh. recording sound. Then we had a producer that was guiding us everywhere. The filmmaker was there, Iran. And then Iran, so, and then Ariel Stashel was And we there had a bunch of musical George, instruments, too. George Abood. So there was many of us, like a clown car, many of us in this van, <laughs> just in the desert, driving, driving, driving. So we spent a lot of time together, which was actually really, really wonderful. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it, you get this, these moments when you realize... Holy shit! Everyone in this van is is like a a good person, you know. Like is a, is a really good hang, yeah. you know. Plus, there's two darbukas. Those are the drums, yeah. and there's a violin. <laughs> she plays violin, you know. George plays violin. There's a wow. oud, you know. So there's music constantly. And, David literally wrote a piece of music that's in the show while we were in that van. He played. He still has the audio. I played it for you, yeah, yeah, the other day of, of him writing it in real time, and then I'm like going George. George Abood is the is is sort of the the really the master musician in this show, and um, he plays fiddle as well as oud, and he's pretty incredible. One of the best musicians I've ever worked with, and um, he handed me the oud at one point. The oud is that sort of lute, uh, fretless lute, and I'm playing it, I'm playing it, and I realize oh I think I'm on something, and I started recording it, and you can hear on the recording <laughs> me coming up with this melody, and then saying George, George, what do you think? You know, he's going, oh, that's good. That's very authentic. That's what he said. <laughs> and I just played it for them the, the other day. And that was in the van. Like, all of yeah. this happened in the van. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, but then we got out of the van, and, you know, Katrina had the fiddle, and I had the zarbuka, and George was playing oud, and we played for a bunch of strangers, you know, and um, that was really fun, you know, and um, it was a great, it was really a good time, and the food was really good. <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah. John, I read where you said that this show has taught you to embrace the unknown as an actor. I said that? Yes, you did. <laughs> because David Cromer told you something. He reminded you something about staying slow. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Would you tell, talk, to, talk to us about that? I move fast. Yep. And <laughs> you just encouraged us, particularly in the dinner scene, to let stillness be to let things be 
Um, I remember once <laughs> when we were in tech, the transition out of the cafe into the watermelon scene, I call it, when uh, Dina brings Khaled and Tofik to her apartment. Um, you asked for that transition to be really, to everyone, for everyone to move very slowly. And you told me after I had moved very slowly that I wasn't moving slowly. <laughs> and it, that was like seminal for me because I realized, oh, like I really have to slow down. And that was really helpful to, 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 to think slowly, to not make decisions quickly, like to learn. Like in New York, you make decisions quickly and you move quickly and you think quickly and to learn how to... I just remember what it was like growing up where I grew up. Everything's slow. And so just really slowing down was kind of hard. And, and I, I'm not ever slow on stage. I don't ever play slow moving people. And so it was kind of interesting to learn to do that. And when you told us you're not moving slowly, I was like, I'm not. I thought I was. It was, it was cool. Was I screaming? No, was no, you weren't mad. You just told us all You were things. screaming slowly. <laughs> Carry <laughs> Top of your lungs, but real slow. <laughs> We have a question from the audience. This is from Kevin. It's a question for David. Is oh, Kevin. This, Kevin, is this for David Cromer or David Yazbek? Okay. How do you approach a new piece before rehearsals begin? Well, it's terrifying because I, I, I used to not do a lot of new material, and then I sort of got, would get thrust into it. And you have to have a relationship with the writers, and I'm always sort of terrified um, of asking for... Like, I'll read something else. I'll say, I really think this needs... Um, I don't get this. This doesn't feel right. You know, when you have access to writers in the same way that an audience, actors, this is happening if you're doing a play and the audience comes up to you afterwards, they have a question. If they didn't get to talk to you, they would figure it out for themselves. But because you're there, they ask you. So I'll not understand something and I'll go, well, this should be different. This should be changed. That was always my impulse. And I realized I have to sort of pretend they're not going to change it, or at least try to pretend they're not going to change it, and say, what is this? What is this? What is this meant to be? Um, I hopefully try to figure out what uh, I understand and what I don't understand, and try not to be prescriptive, um, to try, and I fail at this all the time, but this is just, I try, to try to just ask what this is, what this wants to be. I used to think... I knew what needed to change, and they would have to change it, um, which was, of course, <laughs> ludicrous. And uh, 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 what I eventually found out is that is that I just don't get, you know, like th th if they can if they can explain it to me, then I can I can adapt to it and run with it, you know. So hopefully, the idea is to try to figure out what I know and figure out what I don't know. Um, uh, I worry a lot that I maybe do that a little too much, like I don't. I don't, I, I'm not confident enough about my prescriptions to push for them, which maybe is a good thing. Um, uh, uh, that's sort of the answer that flew into my head when you asked the question. Is that I, I mean, I observe, I observe that on this, because we, we, as you mentioned, we worked together once before, but it was 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I don't know that I even remember it that well. But uh, on this process, it really was clear to me that when you came to me and said this, you know, X, Y, or Z line or moment, I think that might need to change, that it was your last resort. Like it was clear that you had, you would only come to me with that when you had really tried to make something work as, you might have a question earlier or whatever, which, which get, put me in a position where I was like, oh, I, I should take that seriously because he's not just gonna, that's just not gonna come flying out as his first reaction. There's an old joke, which is there's three great motivators, food, sex, and the desire to rewrite somebody else's play. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to remember that right, right, right. to not, you know. There are, you know, there are directors who have a reputation of being really great yeah. as long as the writers are dead, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So what David's describing is actually a real gift for, if you are yeah. one of the authors or the author because um, what he's doing is he's putting, it's an interpretive art form supposedly, but he's putting this, this uh, not easy effort into getting into your head and into honoring your work. And then if he does have an idea and wants to change it, you're like, well, he's done the work, you know? So it's a, it makes for a really much better collaboration. This is a question about punctuality and arriving to the theater early. You know, this is such a mesmerizing, it, it's, a, it's a hypnotic show to watch and you all seem so common in your space. 
Who likes to get to a theater early? Who rushes at the last minute? Not Adam Cantor. <laughs> <laughs> who makes half hour? Who wants to start actors? I'll start. Okay. Um, I like to get there as early as possible, like a big nerd. And, uh, but usually I get there like an hour before because it's, it is, it is hard to get out of your New York brain and get into the brain of the show. So the, the more acclimating time I can have is better. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think like other shows I've done, they usually start with like a big number or like with like a lot of energy. So like if you just rush in and you get ready and then you just like jump on stage, you kind of just like, it's, I find it a little easier to just jump in, but with this show, it's not, it's much harder because <laughs> it's like the show starts and it's like, whew, you know? Um, so uh, I like to get there about an hour early. Sometimes we do a little skate call before the show just to make sure we're all like, like, you know, on our skates, we're not gonna fall that night. And we do that 45 minutes before the show. Um, so yeah, I like to get there early and just kind of like focus in. I'm a half hour guy. <laughs> Yeah, I fluctuate between half hour and maybe 15, 20 minutes before, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean before no, half hour? No, I'm sorry, hour. before half hour. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not, <laughs> no, I'm a responsible Adam actor. No Adam Cantor here. I get nervous if I'm there too early, though. I don't like to think about what I'm about to do. I like to just go do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. Uh, yeah, if too much time is, I, I, it's, I'm in a weird mindset then. Yeah, I'm like too down. Because we've had many actors here, and some stars like to get there early. Stocker Channing likes to run in at like, you know, 30 minutes before, have the wig put on, go on stage, and deliver these incredible performances. Like you're saying, the people at half hour right, just throw themselves into their costume and just go on stage. So it's just interesting how, you know, the work ethic is all different. And they're it's all, oh, all sorry, valid. go ahead. I was just saying they're all valid. Yeah, and yeah. also, oh, totally. something that David actually warned us about, which actually really happened to come true. It was a very different experience doing this show downtown because we were in Chelsea and it was like on this gorgeous street with yeah. trees and there was like no one on the block as you walked into the theater. And it was very like chill and zen. And, and here, you know, it's Times Square and you're like, people are bumping into you the minute you get into the stage door. And so it's just a different energy right when you walk into the building and it really does affect your evening. This is a question. Since there is a history of forces working against harmony in the Middle East between Israel and Egypt, etc. I thought you meant musical harmony for a second. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> did you, from the creative team, did you ever think for a while maybe this show will go over and maybe it won't? Go over? Like you... go over with audiences, you think? Did you ever second guess yourselves at any time during the process? No, I, I mean... At every I, time during the process. <laughs> but no, not I, about that. I, yeah, second guessed, we second guessed all of us about a million things, but that was not that was not one of them. Yeah. Um, you know, we all, you know, even early, early on, Itamar and I looked at each other and, and said, if, man, man, you're handsome. No, we looked at each other and said, um, uh, if, we, if we write this show for, for, the, for the Atlantic, if we write this show for the 200-seat theater and we, and we make it that show, then it will go to Broadway. If we write it for Broadway, we, we'll screw it up. And, and part of that is what you're describing, um, knowing that... Um, this is a show, you, it, it could be any two groups, you know? It's about the, the, the two groups who perhaps think that they're enemies or you think they're enemies coming together because it, that's all man-made, all that, all that distinction is man-made. Yeah, I mean, the, again, as, as, as Cromer said, like the, the movie is like sort of our where it all begins and ends and the movie's attitude towards that stuff seems to really work uh and we felt like um first of all you know if it's i my attitude in a lot of uh with a lot of aspects of the adaptation was if it's not broken don't fix it but more specifically like um that was kind of what was beautiful about it we've we've talked about this before and that there's this question of like is the show political should it be more political is it political in the right way is it not political enough and like i it, our feeling was always it's political and the political argument that it's making is that politics are like sort of arbitrary and that don't really have anything to do with the most basic human like longings and, and needs. And that's the argument the film makes and we felt like we wanted to, to, to carry that through. There's, we've, uh, there's this beautiful moment early in the movie that's in, a, in our mind sort of the thesis statement for that, that 
take on the material, which is when they arrive at Dina's cafe and they all sit down, um, there's a photo on the wall of a tank. It looks like it might be from the, the 67 war, which was literally one of the ones in which Israel and Egypt were in direct conflict. And, um, and one of the musicians takes off his hat and just hangs it over the photo. Which, which works as a sort of diegetic moment of like, of like okay, we're going to, uh, uh, let's not worry about this right now because it's not going to help us in this interaction that we're having. But it also has always felt to us like a macro sort of statement from, from Iran about what the movie's attitude towards the politics. Iran Kohler, not Iran the country. <laughs> right. From, yes, uh, from Iran Kohler and about uh, what, what the take on the sort of politics will be, which is that it's going to be, Subtext. It's going to be an undercurrent. It's going to be literally buried under these powder blue uniforms. And it and it is. It's it, it's interesting because people say why. Sometimes people say why isn't it more political? And first of all, that means they have a very specific agenda they would like it to have. And there's a lot of those. So the play would get very very long if we had to address address all of those. And uh, the the other one is it it is inherently political because it says this group of Egyptians are stuck in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of Israelis, what that is inherently a conflict. Uh, uh, what happens is not, so we don't say there is no problem. There is a pro, there's quite a big problem. These people don't happen to know what to do with, it, with that problem. And, and as Itamar said, or, or maybe you said it really well, which is food and shelter is necessary. And that most people would probably help someone who's standing in front of them who seems sort of harmless, who needed food and shelter. Um, it just happens to go that way. And, and so it is not, it's not ignoring that it happens to be that, you know, most people are, are just sort of don't really understand these larger conflicts and are just sort of, you know, it's, it's not, we're not never saying everything is fine, <laughs> you know. I just love yeah. that you just, it's all about humans. This yeah, whole thing yeah, about human yeah. emotion. Well, it, it you know, people are, people are, there's a, you know, uh, there's the character Tufik. Uh, I was talking with the actor, uh, Darius Kashani, who's playing it uh, right now. And we say, you know, this guy's all alone with his problems. And over the course of the evening, he gets in a conversation with someone and is able to talk a little bit about his problems. That's a big thing. That's a, a seismic thing, and it is a little more important than some thing I don't, you know, that neither of them quite understand, you know. Yeah. And sorry, can I just also yeah. add that, you know, I mentioned before that being of Israeli background, playing an Israeli is, is, is great, but being able to play an Israeli without that political agenda, without yes. the comment on the politics, just being a human who happens to be living in Israel is... Is, is a gift, really. It's, it's, it's great to be able to move past that in a way. Sure. For David Yasbeck, you teach musical theater writing, right? I do some master classes sometimes. I'm not, not I don't think of myself as a, t a teacher. I like doing it when I do it. But I know I read something where you, the advice that he gave to his students was don't listen to musical theater writing for a year. Yeah, I mean, what I find is when I teach these master classes at BMI or I, I was just in Minnesota, uh, you find people who... <laughs> I, I, I came... I know a lot about musical theater and I went to it as a kid. I grew up in New York City, loved a lot of it, but I wasn't a musical theater nerd, quote-unquote. And there's something about that word nerd that is uh, a little bit limiting because it assumes... It, it, it all of a sudden means that you're just steeped in one kind of thing. Now, music is music. And um, when I see people uh, presenting songs that just sound like not fresh to me, um, and, and in every class there's a lot of that, it's because that's, that's, that's their dream. That's all they ever... Well, if that's your dream, then, you know, contribute to it by bringing fresh air into it. And the way to bring fresh air into it is to have more influences <laughs> than just two musical theater composers, let's say. So that's so. My advice is always um, the homework is stop listening to musical theater for a year and listen to everything else that you can find. Listen to everything: Chinese opera, Delta blues, jazz. You know, just find it, listen to it, give it a, give it a listen, see what what sparks you. 
And by the end of that year, you're going to have all these tools you didn't have before that you don't, you don't even know why you have them. Tools of harmony, tools of, of uh, you know, rhythmic uh, patterns, um, and, and even getting into the head of other cultures. You could do it through cooking, t- you know, too, if you were a chef. Um, so, yeah, that's my World advice. music. No, not just world music. I mean, all music is world music. Yeah, Depends yeah. where you are in the world, you know. So, um, you know, listen to, uh, listen to death metal, you know, listen to everything. There's something, there's, there's a lot of bad stuff out there, but there's something good in almost every genre, you know? If you could each, this is one of my final questions, if you could each sum up the best part of the experience of being a part of the band's visit, or the incredible fan base, they have this incredible fan base that all started down at the Atlantic Theater, because I remember when we first found out this show was being at the Atlantic, it sold out in like two days. You couldn't steal a ticket at the Atlantic, and everybody wanted to get into this incredible, beautiful musical down there. But there are fans that saw the show down there, and you have a beautiful fan base on Broadway, and just the way your musical touches an audience. If you could just sum up the best part of the experience, whatever that is, what is it for each of you? I'll start, if that's cool. Um, I think the best part has been, like you said, with the fan base, um, hearing from people on social media that are like either actors or just younger, younger folks that are Middle Eastern that have messaged me and said like, I feel like I've never seen myself on stage and I feel like I'm seeing myself, someone who looks like me, someone who has crazy curly hair like me and has a huge nose like me and has the same skin color as me and and is speaking Arabic or Hebrew and and they just feel like so so represented and I I think if I was like in high school and saw this show my mind would have been blown so I feel so grateful to be representing them and and so grateful that they are represented I I would just say that um as we encountered challenges and problems, um, everybody, it was very easy for everybody to uh, help solve them. That, that you, you didn't see a problem and you had to convince anyone it was a problem. When we would identify things we didn't, couldn't make work, it was sort of all hands on deck. And, and in a very productive way so that I don't know who solved what problem and I don't care. They just got solved, you know, <laughs> or some of them did, or the one, you know, the ones that didn't get solved. Luckily, you know, nobody's mad about. I mean, for me, um, uh, in addition to the things that I've said already about about the lesson about how a good collaboration works and and being focused on the right things, what it can lead to. I mean, it's my Broadway debut, um, and I'm I'm. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm 40 on the nose. I turned 40 in, in August. And there's a point, there's a thing that, there's a thing that happens. Um, uh, this is a l- slight tangent, but my first TV job, I worked for, uh, for Ray Romano. I wrote on a show called um, Men of a Certain Age, which is a show he did on TNT. And he was the showrunner. And so I was in the writer's room with him every day. And he's very famous, enormously rich, and really nice. And, and uh, really nice, neurotic, but like very nice guy. Wonderful to work for. Um, and, uh, and I remember thinking like, you know, I think that has something to do with the fact that that everybody loves Raymond didn't happen until he was like 39. Like it didn't start. Like, and, and it meant he, he, he glimpsed, uh, he, you have to, at a certain point, you have to say like, as you said earlier in a different context, like, well, maybe this is, maybe this is it. This is what I'll do. Certain things won't happen for me. Um, and then it happened in this incredibly unexpected way. I mean, I, uh, Band's Visit was my third musical in a row and it struck me as the least likely to move to Broadway. Um, and, uh, and I didn't, I, by then the other two hadn't moved. So I wasn't, ex- I really wasn't expecting it. Um, so that just personally, that's been, I'm still processing what the lessons are of all of this, but I know there's a lot of them. This is also my Broadway debut. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's hard because I'm a little spoiled now. Um, yeah, I think piggybacking on what Sean was saying, my favorite part is introducing this part of the world to an audience, to an, uh, a Western audience, an American audience that might not know these instruments, um, know this music, and, and understand that, again, these are 
people uh, living their lives and struggling like everyone else. I mean, this show could take place in a little town in Montana, you know, it, it can it can be anywhere. So um, I, I think that's that's my biggest takeaway. This is a really hard question. Really hard. <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking, and I, I think um, there's not one thing about this show that I'm not in love with and proud of. Like I'm just in love with the story. I'm in love with um, the place the story came from. I'm so proud of everyone that's developed the show and is working on the show. I'm so proud that we have Middle Eastern representation in the show, and I'm I'm just I just I'm just. And I'm so pr proud and happy that people are responding to it the way that they are and that we get to sing this beautiful music. And it's just like, this doesn't happen very often that you can feel so um, inspired and in love with the, the project that you're in in, in, every, in every place you look. And so that's, that's just uh, a once in a lifetime thing, I think. I, th I think for for me it was uh, when we were down at the Atlantic, we couldn't see or hear the show really. So I had no idea what I was in. <laughs> because we once just threw it together, right? <laughs> well, no, no, we did. We did. We had to just blast it onto the stage, and you guys were stuck backstage. <laughs> and we really, we didn't, we just didn't know. And we had, there was only one place from which we could enter, it was the back. So we always had to come in from the back. We didn't, never saw anything. And just, uh, watching these guys work and bring it to life and feeling it change and I don't know it was like a leap of faith kind of right because it was so scary at first and then slowly realizing that it was something very beautiful I've, I've never experienced that I mean I, I usually you know what you're getting yourself into and I had no idea what we were and just watching them build it was it, it felt like just a like a slow like a flame that started really, really small, starting to burn. And it was just a really, I sound so lame, but it was just, it was faith. I learned about faith is like, just have faith and go do it and contribute your part and it will become beautiful. And it did. And we could feel it because of the way people responded. It was very different every night as, as it grew. <laughs> and now we're at a place where people come back and cry in my dressing room. Like they'll come sit in my dressing room and cry. And you're like, my friend from my friend from my hometown came in and she sat in my dressing room and she said, I can't talk to you, I have to cry. I was like, great. So we just sat there and she <laughs> cried for a while and it's very interesting. <laughs> a lot of a lot of people have that experience. Yeah. And they don't and they just say, I don't know why I'm crying, I'm just going to cry. And you're like, it's okay, just go ahead. <laughs> so I get to work with people like the guy you just were heard talking, you know. I mean, to me it's like moments uh, life, you know, there's just the present moment. That's what you get. That's what you get. That's what you're getting now. Um, being up on the stage with these people uh, reminds me about how every moment uh, was valuable in the, in the making of it, in the collaboration. So, you know, working with these two guys and just hanging with these two guys, having meals and stuff, and with Oren Wolf, the producer, you know, like the four of us, that's, you know, that could be a very entertaining three-hour meal for us. You know, maybe not for anybody else, you know. <laughs> Um, the thing that sticks out, and you know, just when I do see the show, just the the realization in the moment that it's tr that it still feels true, that that um, that the moments within the show feel true. I don't I don't recall that being the case in any musical I've worked on. I've been entertained, and there are occasional moments, but this is really something special. Um, and then there's like this, what sums it all up for me is listening to Katrina sing a song that I wrote that almost wasn't in the show. <laughs> and the first time I heard her sing it, and now the, you know, 200th time, whatever, however many times it is, um, uh, the Omar Sharif song, and still getting chills because she approached, well, aside from just her talent, you know, I mean, she's created this. This is an original part that she's created in a musical. And um, when I hear that song, which was, which I was very proud of immediately, just exponentially improved, you know, by her performance, it's, uh, 
you know, it's kind of encapsulates my entire experience with the show, you know, just how fortunate I am to have been in part of this. Beautiful. My final question is, these are, this is a house full of actors. Many actors will be watching this and book writers and songwriters and everything else. You're all at the top of your game. What is the best bit of advice that you all live by that you've been given either personally or professionally? I'll, I'll say, I said it already once, which is take your, take your work seriously, but don't take yourself seriously. That allows you to be serious about your work and to play in it as well. Um, you know, if you have to go auditioning, if you're an actor over and over and over again, um, there's joy in the actual audition. Find that joy and um, that, because that's your life. That's going to be, that's going to be your life. Again, it's about moments. So um, that would be mine. Um, I mean, in terms of how to approach the work creatively, I think the best advice has something to do with, um, with humility, like the humility to be your, to know that you don't know the answers, that your conscious mind um, will often come up with worse ideas than the idea that comes from someone else or from seemingly nowhere, and the humility to embrace the good idea when it comes, to, to know that you'll never, the next thing you start will never be protected by some aura of anything you've done before. Um, it's always going to be a new set of lessons and a new mountain to climb. Um, yeah, and then what I and then a more sort of career practical advice thing that I tell students at the end of the semester when I when I teach writing is that um, is that persistence, luck, and talent are all important um, in that order, not in order of importance, but in chronological order. That um, that persistence is sort of creates opportunities for luck, and then luck creates opportunities for your talent to be recognized, uh, and you you kind of need all of those things to 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 make a life in this insane. Um, business. <laughs> wow, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't have any advice. If you have any advice for me, um, uh, I, 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 this is weird. This is tiny and specific. It isn't too life changing. It's to actors, which is um, we so desperately want you to help us solve the problem, which is that we can't cast this part, and we are always. Actually, some people are some audit, some directors and things. I'm sure are monsters during auditions, but m most of us desperately need you to solve our problem for us. So we so badly want it to go well, you know. And when it doesn't happen, it isn't for a lot of the reasons you think. Like you were terrible, <laughs> you know what I mean? It isn't. It isn't. It just didn't. Wasn't quite exactly what we. I know that's that's sort of prosaic and after all the, the poetry but it is it is we so we so we need you so badly <laughs> oh um there's lots of advice it's like people things people have told me that are swimming around my head right now i'm trying to find like what's the best um so i don't know but this one just is at the top right now is just to similarly i guess but from the actor's point of view to remember that everyone is a person everyone is a person and treat them like people treat them like human beings and also be a human being yourself um before being an actor and before being a whatever you're a first you're a person and do that uh i i guess we spend most of our time not knowing what the heck we're going to do next and i guess enjoy the great gift of not knowing <laughs> because it's possibility um, I think when I first moved here, I, I thought, like, I have to get everything, like, right. And if I get it right, then I'll get the job, right? Like, or, or like, you know, associated with talent. Like, the best singer will get it, or the best dancer, or the best actor, whatever. And then I realized, I think, um, when I just stopped worrying about, like, getting it right, quote unquote, and I just was like, well, what, what, was, what is Sharon going to do? Like, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? And I just focused on what I felt I should bring to it, it didn't, it, it was right for me because it was me, right? And, and that might not be right for someone else. And I let go of this idea of like, correct or not correct. And I think that really helped me because there's so many ways that anything can be right, right? Right? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I, similarly, I think just trust yourself. I mean, everyone, uh, you know, might sound trite, but 
you we're all special. Um, no, but we are who we are and trust that that's enough. Um, and don't feel like you need to do more than, than that and, and trust that what you bring and the choices that you make, make choices, and those choices are what you bring to the role. So when you go into a room, you know, say, this is me and this is what I would do. And if you like it, great. And if you don't, either give me a note or, you know, moving on. And then, and then move on. <laughs> that is beautiful. I have to tell you, I've been doing this for 27 years, interviewing everybody in the theater. And I have to tell you, this is one of the best afternoons I have spent. <laughs> you are all the best at what you do. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the company of The Band's Visit. Thank you very much for being here today.